And welcome to Reliving My Youth, the show where we look back at pop culture from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. My name is Noel Fogelman. This week, we're going to boldly go where this podcast has never gone before. I know, I know, that was awful. This week's guest is Tim Russ, better known as Tuvok from Star Trek Voyager. Uh, Tim, believe it or not, has been in a lot of other Star Trek stuff, and we'll get into that as well. Uh, A lot of kids know Tim as Principal Franklin from uh, Nickelodeon's iCarly. I know that's where my kids know him from. Uh, We get into his uh, musical career. He's a pretty accomplished musician. We got to get into that. The state of the music industry. And one of my all-time favorite movies is Spaceballs. And believe it or not, I did not know that Tim was in Spaceballs. Believe it or not, he was the Spaceball that said, we ain't found shit. It didn't occur to me until a few months ago, and that was actually Tim. And helping me relive my youth today is Tim Russ. Tim, how are you today? Doing all right. Doing okay. Yes, so, um, so much to get to, but let's start from the beginning. When did you first uh, want to become an actor? Uh, well, I, mean, I, I, was, I, I got uh, interested in it when I was in high school. I was 16, and I was uh, taking acting class in high school as an elective. And uh, there a couple of uh, plays that were put on by the school at that time. And um, I really enjoyed it, so I decided to uh, go to a college that specialized in theater and uh, and got my uh, uh, bachelor's degree in uh, theater. Now, um, I know you're an accomplished musician as well. What was acting or music your first love? Uh, well, music actually, I mean, I was, I was playing music uh, before uh, I finished high school. I started playing music roughly around 15, 16 years old, and um, and then kept playing all the way through to present day, but that, that sort of took off first, and then later on, the acting uh, picked up. Right now, uh, you've recently released um, a new CD with music. Can you just talk about a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, I just recently released, um, it's probably uh, the third or fourth CD in a line of them that uh, is called Lifeline. And um, and it's, uh, it, it's featuring a little bit more, I want to say, of the, of the blues pop sort of sound um, in terms of the feel of the music that's on there uh, compared to the other CDs that I had before. So uh, there's some cool stuff. I've got a couple of my own tracks on there, and then uh, there's some other tracks that are from different uh, blues artists like Little Dixon, Howlin' Wolf, um, you know, uh, Kev Mo. So uh, there's a number of pieces on there um, from a number of different artists that are basically um, rearrangements and covers. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I really enjoyed Kev Mall, so I'll have to check that out. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, now, um, you're not the only uh, member of the Trek universe who is a musician. Oh, uh, Brent Spiner plays Data, released, I yeah, think, yeah. an album or two. Have you ever thought of working yeah. with him? <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, he does. Bob Petrano also sings as well. Uh, Max Prudential also sings. Right. Chase Masterson's a singer also. I mean, we all have our own, you know, uh, styles in music, and uh, and they don't really do it um, as, as, as much as I do. I'm the one that's still, out of all of them, that's actually performing on a regular basis uh, with my own band uh, here in L.A. So, um, you know, that, I, I don't believe that they're pursuing um, that aspect <coughs> of performing that much. Um, and our styles are all very different. Now, do you ever do you stay mainly in LA with your band? Do you you know try to tour a little yeah. bit? Yeah, yeah, I'm basically based here. I mean, I don't really have the time to to put together um, you know a big tour of any kind. Um, you know, leaving the the, the 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 state and going out and you know um, playing a bunch of clubs or bars across the country. And I don't really have you know I don't have enough radio play as it were to to warrant that kind of thing either. So. Uh, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be practical to pursue that really at this point. Um, I get booked in a number of gigs here and there that uh, come in from people specifically for us to come play, and those are the ones that I usually take. So I have played overseas several times. It's just that you know it depends on what the event is and what uh, and and what the uh, request is for the band. Right now, I've asked a bunch of musicians their thoughts about 
uh, the music industry now, like streaming rather than like the actual physical copies of CDs or albums. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, it's, uh, that's where everything's headed, and um, and I prefer, you know, to work within the digital world as well. Um, I buy music um, online rather than um, you know picking up a CD in a store, and uh, so I, you know, I think that's a very practical way of doing things. It also keeps your your inventory and overhead down because you don't have to do any reproductions. Um, it's easier to discover like new artists who like don't get really a lot of radio play you know via you know streaming and it's very accessible that way oh completely okay i stumbled on the people by accident uh, simply because i typed in the wrong name you know or or another title that was exactly the same title as what i was looking for but it was a different song and then ended up downloading the song that uh, that i accidentally heard you know because i liked it um, yeah totally. I, i've had it happen more than once uh, you know that's that, that, that's essentially uh, how it's done. And nowadays, it's like, you know, uh, you use the phone apps and you can just be in a store and hear it playing on the news app and you just look up the thing and record it, take it off of there, and then go find the track online and download it. I mean, that's that's how it's done. In the old days, you had to wait for the radio, you know, jock to tell you what the name of the song was. Now you just you can just listen to it in a store or in a coffee shop or whatever it might be um, and then, you know, get the name of the song and then go download it, you know, uh, upload it or download it on your phone, uh, and, and you'll have the track. I mean, that's that's essentially how it's done nowadays. Um, and, you know, I'm, uh, I think that for myself, um, my songs are all on CD Baby and they're all on iTunes. So I tell people, if you want to just listen to them, you, you get like almost a minute of sample now. It used to be shorter. Now it's almost a minute long of a sample of the tracks. I mean, you're going to hear enough of the songs to know whether you like it or not. And then if you want to buy it, you just bang right then and there. It's, 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 it's tremendously practical and efficient, and, um, you know, it's the way to go. Some people don't like doing that because they want people just to buy this, the entire CD. They don't want them to buy the single songs, the single tracks on there. Because they want people to spend money on the entire CD. Yeah, I, I bought plenty of CDs where I only like one or two songs, and I, you know, drop fifteen dollars. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And Shazam yeah, is right. Shazam yeah, is Shazam. probably. I'm sorry. Yeah, Shazam is the, because of Shazam. You don't have to do that. I mean, yeah. Or, or if, you, if somebody re- recommends a track, you know, they said, "Oh, you got to check these guys out." Yeah, you go through and you say, mm, "Yeah, I like this track," and uh, the rest of them, I don't really care for. I'm gonna get this one track and be on my way. You know. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. And with, uh, yeah. 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 And with, with Shazam, you don't have to remember, uh, you know, a verse of a song in your head for a while, and so you can actually write it down on a piece of paper. You actually can just hold your phone up. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, again, there's this there's the technology that never used to exist before. You know, to be able to recognize, a, you know, uh, everything from a famous painting to a particular, you know, to a, a measure and a half of a song, and all of a sudden you instantly have the track.
your music in your bedroom, you know, on a laptop program, as many tracks as you want. They're all digital virtual tracks. You can master them, mix them and master them in your bedroom on one computer. And then you can earn the, you can you can upload the songs to C D baby and, and and have them on iTunes within a week. I mean that's that's what you can do now. All of your music, you can do an entire album just like that. You can play every instrument or you can maybe the thing with a keyboard and play all the all the sounds and instruments just off the keyboard. You can do whatever you want now. Uh, set up a sound booth and sing uh, in your own house. That's what you can do now with very minimal equipment. Um, and, and, and make tracks. This is what people are doing. So, um, they, you, know, you don't need a record company. You don't need a, a anything. And, and everything from, like I said, uh, books. People are doing the same thing with books as they are with music, and, and, and they're doing the same thing with uh, motion pictures and films now. They make their own movies. It doesn't take much to do it anymore. You know, so that's the way the world is, man. It's changing everything. Yeah, either, you know, get you know get on the train or get off it, right? <laughs> yeah, and it's unfortunate the train is like, you know, it looks like the trains that you might see in, um, you know, in India and such because they're, there's people hanging off the sides of them and just packed and crammed in, and that's what that is. That is unfortunately, what happens is you have a glut of of artists out there doing music, and you know there's a huge percentage. I mean, they probably have no business making any kind of tracks, right. music, but and then, then then there's a few out there who are very talented and very skilled, and now don't need a record company to make a record, and even they don't need to make a record. <laughs> they don't. They can just upload the material, you know. Uh, and people can hear it, and maybe they'll catch it, maybe they'll like it. You know, the only thing that the company's going to give you is promotional uh, benefits. They'll give you the money to uh, to make a music video that might get played on VH1. They'll give you money to uh, to uh, promote you, um, or or to take you, you know, to take you, you know, and put you out on the road in front of other bands that have bigger names to warm up other groups and to tour with those groups and to promote your album, and they'll give you a certain amount of money, you might get some uh, radio play, you know, for whatever that's worth, because not many people are listening to radio that much anymore. Um, they'll get you out there, you know, to, so that your music is exposed, they'll get you on a, a TV show like Saturday Night Live or Night Tonight Show or whatever it might be, and people get familiar with your stuff. Um, that's it, man. I don't even know... Between now and two years or five years from now, how, you know how anybody's going to find out what my hit song is. My daughter listens to Pandora. I mean, she listens to you know Spotify, a few other people, and and she just they just get the stuff so, you know for, as a reference from everybody, all of her friends that they get from the same source, bouncing around. So it's very to me, it's not the same as it was before. To me, it was record company, radio station, video play, video, music video on MTV of each one, and then everybody knows who you are. You know, to get started, to get established as a new artist. Um, you know, how do you get that? You know, your stuff is, there's so many outlets, potentially, for your material, and along with a whole lot of other people who also have their material in the same place. And how does that one track break through, you know, if you don't have some kind of exposure uh, on television um, of your material or live, you know, with uh, big, big concerts and things like that. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, very, it's very different to me. There's only a handful of people breaking through that, uh, that malaise, you know? Yeah, it's totally. It's, you know, word of mouth or that's it pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it is. I mean, I don't know. The next one, Mr. Funny, you know, breaks out or the next Lady Gaga you know, comes up with a couple of tracks, you know, uh, and breaks out with these tunes. Uh, there are radio stations still playing music, um, as far as I know, right? I mean, there's still radio stations still out, you know, playing tracks. I don't listen to them that much anymore, and my daughter doesn't really listen to them. You know, she gets her music from all the, on the streaming online. So, you know, if the tracks are on Pandora... Um, or somewhere else, how do you, how do they break through all of the other tracks that are on there, uh, 
and become a hit song. You know, how do they get to be that status? How does Billboard rate those tracks anymore? Uh, if people aren't listening that much to the radio. Uh, you know, I know my, like I said, my daughter doesn't listen to radio. She doesn't have a radio. You know, um, there's stations on the phone that you can get, stations on your, uh, you know, online or, you know, the internet that you can get, you can tune into. But again, who's, I, she got, I don't know if she listens to these other stations, you know. I, you know, so it's, it's a, and it's, I think it's all word of mouth and referral. That they find, so she gets them from her friends or gets them from somewhere else, and uh, you don't just stumble onto them anymore. So it's very tricky. I mean, I don't, you know, the ins and outs are very different now than they used to be. They're yeah. Very different. And so when you um, landed the role of uh, Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, you were uh, quite the veteran of uh, Star Trek already. Um, what was it like playing a Vulcan? Well, it's uh, playing that role was counter. Was there ever a day that, like, after you know, shooting, you know, for long periods of time, that you forgot to take off your ears? That I forgot to take them off? Yeah. No, no, no. I, no, I, I always knew that they were gonna, they were there. I mean, they don't feel, I don't feel them that much once they're put on. But um, typically, I wasn't gonna be able to drive off the lot with them still on. You know, it was, it was a matter of routine to go in and get you know, the eyebrows and the ears taken off before leaving to go anywhere. Uh, so it was never something that was a mistake for me just to absentmindedly take off without doing it. Right. Now, um, I think you're one of only a handful of actors who've been in Star Trek who've been pretty much on every series and been on, like, ten seasons of Star Trek. You work with so many captains. Um, who is your favorite captain? Um, well, I mean... I have to say that uh, the working with Kate would be the most uh, my favorite because I worked with her for seven years, um, and uh, so I got to know her as a person as well. So she's uh, she to me was my favorite. Um, I only briefly worked with the other guys, and and, uh, and so I didn't really have a chance to uh, that much of an interaction with them. Um, I enjoyed working with Patrick Stewart just because I enjoyed you know being able to talk to him. Uh, during those few days, um, you know, on set, just in between uh, setups and things, and got to know. So I enjoyed it working with him in that. Um, if I had to pick a number two choice, I would pick Patrick Stewart. I like working with him. I enjoyed working with him a lot. Yeah, which is kind of funny because he played uh, the poop emoji in the emoji movie. So he mentioned number two, and then you know he was number two. So that was kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now. Um, how did you get involved with um, being one of the stars and directing uh, the fan film of Gods and Men? Um, the uh, producer of that project just asked me out of the blue one day if I wanted to uh, to shoot one of it, to shoot it and and uh, play a role. And I said, Yeah, sure. Do that. Um, he uh, it just came out of the blue. To, he asked me about doing it, um, and he didn't even have a script at the time. Uh, he was, the script had to be written, so we kind of all contributed to the story and uh, came up with what we came up with, which I thought was very good. I was very happy and very pleased to be able to, to shoot that project. Um, and that was essentially how that worked. I didn't, you know, it just came to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, the other project as well initially came to me also. They just, he just contacted me out of the blue. I didn't even know what was going on. And asked me if I wanted to be involved in it. So, yeah, I would look at the story and script and try to get something that's shootable. Sure, we can 
do that. Now, were you surprised about the amount of like uh, track actors they've got to participate in those movies? Not really. Um, you know, they're actors, and uh, you, you, you call somebody to uh, resurrect the role that they played before. It's pretty straightforward, and it's uh, you know it's a working uh, it's a, it's a, it's working gig, and it's a couple of days worth of shooting or a week worth of shooting or whatever it might be, and that's not too complicated. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a job, you know, when it comes down to it, it's a gig. So uh, to call all of them, you know, one after the other, if they're available and able to make it, some of them weren't available to do it. We would have had a couple of different actors in there. Uh, a couple were signed up and then had to, 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 to pull out the last minute because they had some other work that came in. So, you know, it's, it, it, many of the actors, once they realized there were a lot of other people involved in this, in this, in this thing, also came forward. You know, uh, I wanted to be on it because others uh, from the Trek world were on it. You know, so it makes it easier to sign them up. But, uh, but yeah, we, you know, it, it was not a surprise to me. Right. Now, how has Star Trek impacted you? Well, it's a it's a franchise. You know, it's a it's a legacy type series. Um, it has a, a major following um, around the world, and it's and they're very loyal fans, very enthusiastic, and you know, to be part of that uh, world, uh, essentially once you sign on to a, a role uh, like the one that I had on the series for seven years, you are part of that franchise in the world uh, forever. You know, I mean, as long as people can remember it or as long as people are watching it. So it's not going away. I mean, they're, they're constantly airing them. People are watching them for the first time. People are watching them again. Uh, so you are part of that world and... In the, fan, the minds of the fans, you will always be part of that world. Now, have they, because um, the Star Trek Discovery is coming out in the fall, have, you, have they reached out to you about participating or even directing any episodes? Um, no one has reached out to me as far as shooting them. They, uh, they are being filmed in Canada, in Toronto, I think in Toronto, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And... Um, Thus far, I had not contacted the, the producer for that show uh, to get a directing slot. I might be able to. It depends on how many they have to have filled by Canadian directors during the season. Okay. So there might not be that many slots to get in there, and, and I get the opportunity to do so. Um, and, and I haven't been approached to be in the project in front of camera either as of yet. Uh, the timeline doesn't work for my character, so whatever it is I end up doing, it'll be something different. Right. Uh, now, um... Which piece of like Star Trek te- technology do you wish you had right now in your present day life? Oh, teleporter. And that's, that's it right there, man. Yeah. Being uh, in L.A., I, right? I, I, yeah. <laughs> They're sitting in 405 traffic, man. I'd rather have the teleporter. That's, that's the way to get around. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to get around. Number two, though, this might be the holodeck. But uh, the first one is the teleporter. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 that's in, it probably in that order would be... Uh, be a very cool thing. Yeah, totally, totally. Maybe, maybe yeah. even have phasers on your car if you're sitting in the 405. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now there's always like this rivalry between like Star Wars and Star Trek, um, you know, the fans and stuff like that. I mean, I'm a fan of both, but you had a great video a couple years ago on uh, May the 4th. How did you get involved in that video? Uh, they just called me then. <laughs> Three days before you know, that day came up. They said, would you come down? It's interesting coming down and doing this. And I said, uh, doing what? And they explained to me. And I said, yeah, I'll throw the prompter up there and we'll, you know, we'll go on and see what happens. I hadn't, it was just a lot. They just called me out of the blue and asked me about doing it. Um, so that, that's how that turned out. I, I wasn't, I was thinking about it and I wasn't really aware of it. Uh, I wasn't really you know, uh, it wasn't on my radar as far as the actual date and the whole gag and how it worked out. So uh, all of it was new to me. Yeah, it, some of the lines, I mean, the first time I saw it, I was sitting on a train to work and I was laughing really? out loud. Some, some of your lines were just classic and just the way you delivered them were really funny. <laughs> yeah, they did a very good job of writing, um, they were writing the thing out uh, to begin with uh, because I didn't see it until... I got there that day, and we just shot the thing you know, piece by piece. It, it was, you know, I hadn't had a chance to go over it that much, but it was very 
very funny. I mean, it turned out to be very funny. I mean, I, I do like that fire so um, I did enjoy, you know, what the whole plug was. Um, I was familiar, obviously, with both uh, projects since uh, the both first one ever came out. Uh, knew, you know, about the, the genre. I knew about the show and the franchise and stuff. And so it was to see what they did with it was very funny. Uh, you know, having a go at all the uh, characters and circumstances and things like that. It's really funny. I like, you know, like, I enjoy that. As far as a, a style of humor, it's satire is something I really enjoy doing. So somebody comes forward with something like that, you know, I'm I'm usually very interested in, in, in participating in something like that. Right. And then probably 30 years ago, wow, um, I had no idea up until recently that you were in Spaceballs. And, like, it cracked me up that I found that that was that was you with that line. Yeah, um, it was uh, back in the day. It was a day's worth of work, and uh, went out and did it, and came home, and didn't think much about it. And it just turns out to be uh, years and years down the line, uh, uh, somewhat of an iconic uh, film moment, as it were, um, that's out there. And and I, you know, it's all it's all after the fact. Um, you know, at the time, it was just a, it was, it was one piece of dialogue and a day's worth of work. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all it was. And, you know, it's grown into its own, this, this huge, uh, iconic sort of, uh, like I said, film moment that people, everybody, everybody seems to know about that, that one line in that movie. I, it's remarkable how many people actually remember that or, you know, are familiar with it. I can't tell you. It's just staggering a number of people. Yeah, that, that whole scene is, is, is classic. And, I mean, he's, Mel Brooks has been, try, I guess, trying to make a sequel for years now. I mean, I don't know if that's ever going to come to fruition, but they uh, come calling. Are you going to uh, get the pick out? <laughs> yeah, you know, if, uh, if, if they manage to get that thing off the ground, which I can't, you know, I, I honestly can't imagine why it wouldn't take more than 10 minutes for somebody to say, yeah, I mean, they're only, they're only remaking every movie, TV show that's ever been made anyway. I and mean, that's, that's basically the theme for the day because the folks in charge of the studios now are all, you know, uh, bean counters and corporate types that, you know, uh, is that are part of the mega corporation and, you know, there's no independent anything anymore. So, you know, it's all about quarterly profits. And if you're going to just raise the library of what stuff you already own and just redo it, you know, 12 times, that, that's, the, that's the, the way everything's going. So I can't imagine why, you know, the studio that their own the rights wouldn't just turn around and say, yeah, let's have this done. You can have it done in a year, you know. Uh, you've got more material to work with. You've got three new movies. Uh, you have the middle three that were done. Um, you could have an absolute field day with uh, a parody. The only thing that, the only thing I could see that might be an issue for them is the fact that they still have, you know, Disney still has the other one to release. So they may want to wait until after those are done and out and have made money before they, you know, uh, green light a part. And quite honestly, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's nothing Disney can really do because it's a part. You can do a satire of, a, uh, of anything. And legally, you cannot be held liable for it because it's satire. So uh, I don't remember who did Space Man. I don't know if it was Universal or somebody out of the studio did it. But whoever did it, you know, the same way they did it before, they could do it again. And they could do it any time if they wanted to. So uh, unless, it's owned, unless it's owned by Disney, unless Disney has the rights to it or has to say so about it, then, then there's no reason why it could get done, especially with no, you know, uh, behind it and executive producing it. And he may be waiting as well until there's an opportunity to get uh, the right story and the right script, and uh, he may want to wait until the last from the out so he can do something from there in the movie. So we don't know what that, that storyline is going to be, given the, the little three that were made and then there were these recent three that were made. We don't know what the last, how the thing's going to wrap itself up. So it may wait until that point in time before they start actually doing it. Uh, and I'd love to be in it again. Sure, I'd like to resurrect that character, of course, in a different circumstance. Yeah, I, I think it was MGM that released it and has the rights. Uh, was it MGM originally? 
right? Yeah, originally, so I don't know if they would still do now. Well, yeah, they're owned by somebody else, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it all depends on, you know, uh, like I said, what the, the timing is, what, the, uh, what they want to do as far as the, the, the last of the films um, that are released uh, of this three to see what they're going to do with this three and how it's going to turn out. Because it may make a big difference if they release it before then. They might be missing out on some stuff that that could be useful to the to the whole thing. So I, my guess is they'll wait until the dirt is out, and then you know let it let it breathe for a minute, and then come out and do the the next parody. And there's no way they're not going to make money. There is no way that they would not make money. Oh, of course. And they can have an entirely different cast. They don't have to have all the same players. They can have an entirely different cast uh, playing the roles or whatever because it's a whole and virtually an, an entirely new audience that's watching it. So, you know, they can get away with all that. Yeah, and, and he, he... And then he, and new characters that have to be portrayed, so... Totally. And he, he could pretty much spoof George Lucas and release one now and then kind of tinker with it, add, you know, the special edition of the movie. <laughs> they had, like, scenes and, you know, ten minutes each movie ended up making, like, a four-hour movie three years later. <laughs> You could, you know, but as a comedy, you know, you'd want to keep that thing around. I would keep it around 90 minutes when I get in and get out quick. Because it's a comedy. You want that pace to go bam, 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 bam. Especially the book style. I mean, you know, I, I would do some of that, and I would, I would prefer, you know, I would prefer a little bit more of a mix in, in terms of the, the comic style. Uh, maybe not so far brilliant, maybe more, you know, garden kind of style. Um, uh, humor, but but you know people like this broad sort of satire and slapstick that's interested in the first one. They cite gags and things like that. You know that's what they like. So you know you've got the stuff to play with. You just have to be really clever about what the story is. You know what story are you going to tell, and then what characters are you going to parody. You know, which one? I mean, there's young people like stories now. Young people are the needs now. So, you know, you're going to have to play characters that are perfectly with those people, you know, with younger actors. And it's easy. How are you going to play all that? You know, um, you still have the old timers in there as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> so you have to, and all of them are parodied. All of them are you know, satirical versions of themselves. So you have to recognize them. You have to see them. You know, it's... Boy, there's so much that there's... I can't even imagine how they would start to structure that thing. I know. Uh, to make it so that everybody recognizes, you know, all the stuff. I mean, the, 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 the like Jar Jar, you'd have to have him at that somewhere. Totally. Know, the judge <laughs> that nobody likes, but then how would you go... Uh, how would you get a parody? I mean, he's almost a parody in and of himself, but you would need some character like that that's in there. You know, somebody, I would pick somebody that they, that everybody in the cast and the story the movie gave, I mean, including the good guys, you know, uh, <laughs> you just have to fight them four times throughout the movie just because they don't like it. <laughs> you know, there's, there's years in there, they're sacrificing or whatever, you know, I mean, it's just, they can have a blast of all that stuff, but everybody would get a kick out of it, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, up to the, it's up to the writers, man. It's up to the people that put, you know, that put the computer screen up and, and put this stuff on paper, you know. Yeah, and yeah, they have plenty of material to work with, but before I let you go... Plenty of material. Yeah, yeah I, I, have, I have two kids, and watch, I don't know, a couple of years ago, my, my son was turning about seven, eight years old, watching Nickelodeon, uh-huh. and all of a sudden I see... Tuvok, Tim Ross, playing Principal Franklin on iCarly. <laughs> yes, correct, yes. Yeah, um, did you audition for that role? Did they come calling? How did that happen? Yeah, I just auditioned for it. It was, um, it was uh, uh, Dan Schneider. He gave me a call. I came in, I read for it. He liked me, and he put me in a pilot. And then, you know, the character became a recurring character. So, uh, yeah, it was, you know, a, t- a little while after Voyager. So it was a chance to break out and do... You know something different. Um, 
on like the death show at the same time I was doing Samantha Who with Christine Appleby. Right. And again, that's a com- that's a comedy also, much yeah. drier, but it's still a comedy. Uh, nonetheless, so I was doing two comics at that point in time after doing, you know, Voyager for that long of time, which is fine, and I enjoy doing comedy. So uh, the show was really well written, really well done. It was a hell of a lot of work because uh, they, they, you know, the producers liked to do a lot of takes and do a lot of rewrites on the day of taping, so it took a while to get through all of it. But it was cool. Those guys were great. They're all pro, and that includes the cast. Yeah, and it's great because like, when you sit through some kids' shows, you know, it's kind of tedious. You kind of just, you know, you sit there with them, you know, maybe yep. fall asleep. Yep. And that was yep. a really enjoyable show. <laughs> that is correct. Diane Schneider is a brilliant writer and producer, and he knows, he knows exactly how to write, right on the border between the adult and, and, and the kids, so that the adult has something to laugh at uh, and enjoy watching it uh, as much as the kids do. And it's not too crazy and, and screaming, hollering, and running around. It's, it's it was a clever premise. The circumstances and situations they came up with were very good and very interesting. And I thought it was uh, very, very well done. Uh, perfectly cast. Uh, very well written. Very well produced. Uh, lots of attention to, uh, given to detail. And uh, it, it, it was good. It, 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 it had a maturity to it that, was, uh, that made it very, very popular and, and allowed uh, the parents to be able to watch it alongside their kids. Absolutely. That's just the way it turned out. Yeah, now, you're walking down the street. Do you get recognized as Principal Franklin or Tuvok? Oh, well, it depends on where I am. I mean, sometimes it's Principal Franklin uh, by the younger kids um, and or kids now who used to be younger. Um, and, and often, and yeah, oftentimes it'll be, uh, it'll be Voyager. Um, I'd say it's probably 50-50, maybe. Maybe a, a few more people will uh, recognize me from Voyager that. Then uh, I call it because uh, I call it mostly the kids, or is it the adults? It's mostly you know, Voyager. Awesome. Do, do they ever uh, shout the "We ain't found shit" line at you at all? <laughs> uh, no, not because <laughs> because the majority of people don't know that I was in that. Uh, there's only you know it's only when they see it that they realize it. Oh yeah, he's in that as well. Otherwise, off the top of their head, of just walking around, they're not going to recognize me from that. It's not too brief. <laughs> Right. Um, they have to see, uh, the, you know, uh, a picture of me in it or something, or somebody had to tell them I had to say something. They wouldn't. They're not going to automatically realize that I was there, right. uh, unless they're hardcore fans of some type, you know. Yeah, Tim. Thanks for a few minutes today. I really appreciate it, and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you very much, man. No worries. Take care. And a special thanks to Tim for joining us today. You can follow Tim on Twitter at Tim Russ. The number two. You can also check him out on his website, timrusswebpage.com. You can follow me on Twitter at the first Noah19. Be sure to like the page, We're Living My Youth, on Facebook. Be sure to rate and review the show on iTunes. Uh, special thanks to everyone who's listening. I can't do it without you guys. And uh, be on the lookout for the next episode of Reliving My Youth.